the recording now. Wonderful. And with that, unless there's any other folks that want to be captured on video with their introductions, we'll go into announcements. Great. So just wanted to provide a brief update on um, updating the vital sign key messages for ORCA. So I know we've been asking a lot of this group with the ORCA occupancy indicator workshops. We are having our regularly quarterly meetings and um, the I'm going to go over kind of what we're proposing for these revisions to the vital sign key messages and then open it up to any questions or um, feedback. So proposing that the coordinating leads um, will begin by reviewing the current key messages, um, drafting revisions while considering some key considerations that we covered during our last meeting, which was how to incorporate or improve the visibility of other marine mammals into the orca vital signs. Um, and so we'll provide a revised key, key messages for orca to the group via the listserv um, using a shared uh, Google Doc or Box Doc um, to collect feedback, input, and edit from members. And we'll be providing that sometime in March and then just soliciting impact from, or sorry, soliciting input from the work group via the listserv and using the online document. Um, we will have a quarter two 2023 meeting where we can uh, provide an overview of what those revisions encompass, but wanted to propose that and just see if anyone has any feedback or, or questions on that proposed revision um, method. And you can use chat or raise your hand. And a thumbs up if you think that's, that sounds good to you. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Great. All right. So keep an eye out for um, on listserv updates um, provided on the, the listserv. So more to come on that. Hey, Nicole. And, yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Since Jared is here, I, I, I just thought I'd flag that um, the cool thing about this year's revisions is that we get to think a little bit beyond Southern resident killer whales. So We've really never delivered any key messages related to BIGS. Um, and obviously, once we have an occupancy indicator that um, relates to them, we'll have a lot more to say. But I did want to flag for folks like Monica and, and Jared that there's an opportunity to work with Lynn and other folks who've been on the Southern Resident Killer Whale Committee to um, at least begin to think about over, over the next few years, how do we bring BIGS into the vital signs uh, messaging? That's um, and I'll, I just wanted to also flag that some folks are introducing themselves for you, Nicole, in the chat. So every, everybody feel welcome to do that. Um, I put a link to the agenda Google Doc in there as well. And I'll share um, a few more things once we get to announcements. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Scott. Great. All right. Well, the next thing wanted to to gauge interest in a in person meeting for fall 2023, and how we're going to do that is use a Zoom meeting poll. Um, it should pop up automatically on your your Zoom window, and it's just three quick questions to gauge you know your level of comfort with in person meetings um, and potential locations as well as we think about scheduling that. So I'm gonna launch it. So comfort being between one and five, one being you're not comfortable at all, five being you're very comfortable with an in-person meeting. Just seeing if you're interested in the fall 2023 being in person. And finally, when we're thinking of where to hold it, just your preference on location using pretty broad areas. It'll give us a sense of 
what we should consider when we're scheduling it. All right. And so, since I'm not a member of your group, that I'm not filling out the poll. Yeah, you can feel free not to answer. It's not required, but this input will be super helpful just for us to understand. I really appreciate it. I'm going to give it just another couple seconds here. And we can well, share. Oh, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to say while we're waiting, I, I can, for those of you who are new or have only worked with us during COVID, there, there was an era not too long ago when we used to have three quarterly meetings that were sort of migrating latitudinally. Um, I think we succeeded in a, at least one cycle of fall meeting in South Puget Sound, Tacoma or Olympia, um, winter meeting somewhere near Seattle. And then we had one meeting up in the Padilla um, Reserve, thanks to Jude Apple, um, which was a spring meeting that made it a little easier for folks from the San Juans to attend in person. So I'm open to all of those, but that's that's why we sort of have three um, three options there. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end the poll. And I just want to say I I put not comfortable, but if things change with COVID, I would be comfortable in person. But who knows? <laughs> who knows what the future holds? Thanks, Susan. Yeah, and thanks, Francis, for putting some considerations in the chat as well keeping citizen um, areas that require citizenship in mind. Um, and an in-person meeting doesn't mean we wouldn't offer a hybrid option, but want to understand kind of the preference of the group before making any decisions on that. So thanks everyone for your part participation. In that, we'll be using that to, to determine next steps for that fall meeting, but the spring meeting will be held um, virtually at this time. All right, moving on. Other, any news, events, funding opportunities? I know I've been sending a couple updates your way via the listserv. Um, the Puget Sound Partnership has uh, several RFIs out. So you have the Puget Sound Salmon Science Investigations, that's open until March 13th. Monitoring to Accelerate Recovery RFI, that's open till April 14th, and we'll be covering that in more detail today. And the Puget Sound Scientific Research RFI, which is open until May 22nd, uh, the 22nd. Any other announcements? I'll open the floor. I can add one. Um, I heard recently about the Marine Waters uh, Report, which is an annual workshop that we've participated in, in the last few years. Um, it, and I put a note in the Google Doc about this, but it's it will happen on Wednesday, April 26th this year um, at the Shoreline Department of Ecology facility. So that's an opportunity for um, particularly leads on specific species to report out about the previous year's condition. Um, so John Kalambakitis has done that recently for baleen whales, but historically we've also done that for southern residents and bigs and harbor porpoises okay. and harbor seals. Yep. So I just wanted to Brent. flag as a cool, ex cool opportunity Brent. that we can do again. Um, and you'll see, I know we're out of time, but mm -hmm. a, few, a few announcements. I put a link into a side project I've been working on, which is a shared photo library. Um, I've asked a few of you for contributions, but we're definitely missing some species. So um, if you're curious, the idea was to pull together um, imagery, our best and favorite photos of any species of marine mammal, and um, have that be sort of pre-licensed so that anybody in PSEMP or the partnership could use it without attribution. Um, so. Hopefully it will be help you know, us get more marine mammals on the covers of reports like the, the annual marine waters report. So I'll put it in the chat just in case anybody needs some eye candy. 
Great. And Tara, you had your hand up. Yeah, hi, thanks. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to get on camera today because I am um, not at my desk. And I wanted to let folks know about the state of the salmon report. So prey related, not it's not a marine mammal report per se, but it is the state of the salmon report for Washington State from the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office. And maybe Keith can put a, a link in the chat for folks. And um, I haven't gotten around to sending it out to the SRKW community, but I plan to do that soon. It just came out last week and there's been some press on it. So I wanted people to be aware of that. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. And we're gonna move on to our next agenda item. Any other updates, feel free to put it in chat and we'll capture that in our, our meeting summary that's sent out. All right, and with that, I'm gonna ask uh, that Don Noviello, and apologies if I'm not pronouncing that right. Okay, that just right. great. <laughs> uh, to present on the Aleutian Isle incident. I'll um, hand it off to you and I'll give you Okay. Permissions. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> hey, good thing. afternoon, everyone. I am Don Noviello with the uh, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the, uh, let's see. Are you seeing the presentation now? Looks great. Okay. Um, a little update on the Aleutian Isle wildlife operations. Uh, my team, the oil spill team from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, serves as the wildlife branch director during these kind of spill response, and we help coordinate uh, the response, particularly the deterrence. And I see I am preaching to the choir as many of my collaborators are on this call, but uh, so you will hear yourself mentioned, uh, or at least your group. Um, so as and get it to advance here. There we go. So I think you're all familiar with the incident, but on August 13th, uh, this last summer, the fishing vessel Aleutian Isle sunk right off the west coast of uh, San Juan Island with about 2,500 gallons of diesel on board. And following the sinking for quite some time, we had sheens and recurrent sheens some fairly large, a mile or two long. These were very thin sheens, uh, but as we like to say, uh, thin, so thin that they often could not uh, recover them. So they're classified as thin and unrecoverable sheens. So putting a boom out or putting sorbents on it didn't help. They were too thin for that. But that does not mean they are not, they are too thin to be harmful to either uh, marine birds or, or whales. So, and we had sheens for, because this vessel sunk in 250 feet of water, it ultimately took 41 days to bring the vessel back up. And we had sheening periodically during that entire period. Uh, I think you guys are all well aware of the Southern Resident Killer Whale. So this is pretty much a redundant slide, but uh, the sheens, even though we have there's some evidence from the past, like um, the Robinson bite spill of about 15 years ago, where uh, some of the Northern residents passed through a thin sheen and have been tracked since and haven't seen any uh, evidence of damage there. Our group of course is more at risk, probably carries a higher internal body load of toxics. So no one could be sure that these sheens did not present a, uh, a threat to the animals. And that's why we, we treat it as if it is a threat to these animals if they inhale uh, these vapors. Um, you can see on this map, this is an old, uh, this is the NOAA's uh, heat map of common occurrences of Southern residents in August. And you can see this green dot, which is where the ship went down. So you can see we are right in the middle of the reddest of the red. So once I realized that, I reached, uh, as Wildlife Branch Director, reached out to NOAA and immediately out to Susan Burden and Howard Garrett, uh, get information on where are the whales uh, today. And uh, I think um, uh, Lynn Berry also reached out to Pacific Whale Watch Association. 
And sure enough, uh, this went down about one o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. And by five o'clock, uh, we had sightings of southern resident killer whales south of Victoria heading towards the island. And by seven o'clock in the evening, they were in fact down by Salmon Banks, just a few miles south of the wreck site. Um, so what can we do about killer whales and oil? Um, basically trying to keep the animals away from the oil is our, really our only option. Um, we know that they don't seem to actively avoid oil spills. Um, and once they're exposed, uh, you can't catch and rehabilitate a large number of, of, of cetaceans. Um, and we know following the Exxon Valdez uh, event, particularly from the work of, of Dr. Uh, Matkin, that uh, groups of whales, both of resident type and transient type that were exposed to oil from the Exxon Valdez suffered ex very high uh, mortality rates in the years immediately following. And one of the groups uh, was a small group to start with. Uh, I think it was AB pod uh, is about 22 to start with, but they've had zero successful reproduction since then. I think last I heard they were down to seven members and they will go extinct. The other group uh, took 25 years to recover to pre-spill uh, numbers, but has recovered to that level. So. So oil is bad for killer whales. Unfortunately, we also learned during Deepwater Horizon of the very negative effects on other delphinids like bottlenose and things from the Battle Area Bay stuff. Uh, so it's pretty confirmed that oil, surface oil, uh, breathing the vapors is bad for uh, for these groups. And our group in particular, because the Southern residents, uh, as it turns out, I believe 66 of the 73 animals in the existing population uh, came in on the 13th. Fortunately, uh, with much luck, uh, they decided to go back out the next morning. Uh, that was just luck. That was no, <laughs> no brilliance on our part, but, uh, but at least we knew they, where they were and where they were going. And, uh, and we knew that they didn't get up to the site, probably thanks to Scott Veers, who uh, reportedly stayed up all night listening to the hydrophone and did not get any detects uh, going past lime kiln that night. Um, so that was good to know and helped us. Now, even though they went back out, we knew that this time of year, they're likely to come back in. So we wanted to get an operation in place to try and keep the whales away. Um, so after reaching out to uh, Susan's group, uh, Orcanet and Pacific Whale Watch Association and the hydrophone networks, both on Canadian side and, and our side, we started monitoring the location of whales every two hours, putting out a report where they were and, and monitoring any time they approached the, the salvage site. Uh, we got, a, in addition to both, uh, both uh, resident and bigs type killer whales. We had humpback whales, minke whales, dolls porpoise with sea elephant, harbor seals, and river otters. And uh, there were also just a, one or two sea otters and a sea lion or two in the San Juans near the salvage site at some point during the response. Uh, we assembled equipment and trained and deployed a deterrence team the deterrence team was led by either NOAA or the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Ocean. And we put this group together from a list of resources we had in our plan, but we had to individually go to each one and say, okay, now we have a problem. Can you help us? And the people at, I'll, I'll talk about who all the, all the groups. We got a lot of help from a lot of groups. Um, uh, so, and so we were able to attemble, assemble up to 10 vessels uh, from government agencies and NGOs. Now, this is sort of a spoiler alert, but luckily at the end of the whole 41 days, we, despite watching as intensively as we could, we had no observations of whales surfacing in a surface slick. So we think we've dodged significant risk with that. 
Um, so finding the whales, uh, like I said, we worked with Orca Network. Uh, they had someone on call who reported all the sightings to us every two hours. We also got, we're able to use the proprietary uh, Pacific Whale Watch Association product to look where they were seeing whales. We had contact with the research community and the Canadian uh, DFO had uh, monitoring sites out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and up by the Fraser River on hydrophone and and uh, we had the ones at Lime Kiln and, and farther north in Rosario um, that we got reports from periodically uh, on where these animals were. And we put out a little report like this, the graphic here about every two hours or so, everybody knew what the risk was. Um, we did have whales approach the incident site uh, about 18 times between the 13th and the 21st, about half and half uh, southern resident killer whales and uh, the others were bigs. Um, we deployed the deterrence team at least six times um, because we put them out uh, when we knew whales were coming or when we knew there was a high risk operation like they were gonna be lifting the vessel or moving the vessel because it tended to leak sheens during those activities. So we wanted to have the uh, deterrence team out just in case, because we knew there'd likely to be oil. Um, we, on August 28th, we put them out with whales coming. And once again, we got lucky. Uh, we had our team between the, the salvage site and the whales, which were approaching from the south, but they turned around on their own. And once again, went back out to sea the next day. So. Uh, they, they, we didn't even have to bang on the pipes there. On two occasions, on September 18th and September 20th, even though there were only smaller sheens in the area, the teams under the direction of NOAA and, uh, did attempt to use the pipes. And I, this was actually recorded on the lime kiln uh, hydrophone to deter the T-60s, two big, males uh, of the bigs type. And uh, this was informative in that they did react to the signal, uh, which was, a, it was kind of the minimum signal. We only had three boats and the pipes for three boats. But unfortunately, in deep water there along the west side, they didn't just turn around and go the other way, which would, of course, be our hope. But they, what they did is just dive a lot deeper and go a lot farther. So that's a concern. So we're, you know, ultimately we'll be looking for ways to make these uh, to signal more um, deterrent-like <laughs> to these animals, either by adding more boats and more pipes, or maybe uh, using some technology to get the signal down lower under the water so that they would uh, perceive it more three-dimensionally. Um, the deterrence teams that we put together, they were managed by the wildlife branch, by my staff. Um, uh, they're either in the field because we want someone with real good knowledge of the behavior and whether we're doing more good than bad uh, in charge. We had either a uh, researcher, um, Brad Hansen from NOAA. or a specialized group uh, in charge. And we had crews, Orca Wildlife, Sound Watch, the Sea Doc Society, and the Whale Museum. And there was a, another boat occasionally participated uh, with Jeff Foster's crew. We used small boats with these long, these Akomi pipes, these long metal pipes hung over the side uh, and struck with either a hammer or a club to make this underwater sound. In the lower right picture here, you just see the red is where the salvage site was. And you can see the vestiges of some very light sheen out here. This was a day when some salvage operation was going. And the yellow arrows indicate where all of the, deploy the deterrence vessels were arranged. They try to keep them less than 200 yards apart as that's currently the protocol for, for what would be effective. And so that if any whales approach from the south here, we could start sounding on these pipes and hopefully get them to move out or away from the sheen. 
So uh, lessons learned, uh, even though we've done a lot of planning, it still takes a day or two to actually organize, equip, and train the, the crews that, that gladly volunteered to do this work. Um, you know, it was kind of scary and, and frustrating on the very first day I, when they came in with just within just a few hours of the spill, there was just no way we could get people with boats and pipes out there that fast. Um, but we would like to get them as fast as possible. Um, the, in addition with the people who were initially, they were not paid by anybody. They just said, we'll do it because we love the animals. Uh, there are some unresolved liability issues on these volunteer crews. Who would pay if something went wrong or uh, some issues like that? So we just felt that you know, in the ideal world, contracted on-call assets with annual training would be preferable. That's sort of an aspirational goal, but that's one of the lessons learned. Uh, we need to do more training, joint training with the between the U.S. and Canada, as we had some. Uh, it's just good to know what they're going to do and what we're going to do. They have a, a capable group and a lot of equipment on their side, and uh, we want to work together well. Um, and then we did have some issues relative to people didn't understand the existing transboundary plan called the Can US PAC plan for working together on an oil spill. And we had, uh, you know, because the Canadians would come from their side and we'd go out from, from our side and uh, the boats would meet up and they would talk and they would pass uh, some equipment back and forth. And we got some static from immigration on the Canadian side or customs, I think it was maybe on the, on the, on the Canadian side that you can't do that. You can't touch and pass stuff back and forth. So um, even though it should be allowed under the Can US PAC plan. Uh, monitoring the whale's location worked pretty well during daylight hours because we got all that good stuff from OrcaNet on the visual sightings and, and they would have people who would periodically go to a particular location where we were concerned and even spend extra time looking for these animals. Uh, uh, and then, uh, but at night, we pretty much lost them with the exception of the hydrophone network. Uh, but there's only a couple of sites for that. And uh, so it, we would love to be able to, and we are working with uh, some of the groups to expand their uh, number of listening sites. And I know Scott Beer's group is working on AI and different things that will help make it so researchers don't have to stay up all night listening <laughs> for a particular passage. Um, I just another thing, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, non-recoverable sheen is not equal to non-injurious sheen. Um, drones turned out to be really helpful at locating both where the leading edge of the oil is and the whales were and documenting uh, are the response. And finally, as I previously mentioned, the whale's response to the Ecomi pipes is difficult to predict. Uh, so we need more work on making that uh, more effective at deterring the whales. As far as a new initiative census bill, we've been working with uh, Wild Orca to sort of make the some of the members of the group that did deploy on this into a more formal group that we could contact more directly and looking for some grant funding to enable activities for training and uh, outreach to the community uh, in between spills. Uh, at the federal and state level, a task force under the Region 10 Regional Response Team has been created to review and update procedures for an, in the Northwest Regional Contingency Plan on whale deterrence and we expect that to be completed by August 1st. And then the list of marine mammal monitoring and deterrence resources has, is being updated in, on the Ecology Oil Spill 101 website. I think I'm already over my 10, so uh, that's everything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for coming to present on this. It was great. I think questions, there are some questions in the chat. Um, we don't have quite time for a q a right now we're going to move on to our next agenda item but it would be great if you could 
look through I'll the look chat. I'll look at the chat. Just, awesome. Okay. All Thank right. you very Thank much, you everybody. So much, Let's see. How do I un quit stop. sharing here? Yeah. All right. And I will tee up the next agenda item, um, which I think we we lost Erin. She had to to exit, but Rob Williams from Oceans Initiative will be presenting on the Puget Sound Partnership Noise and Marine Water Indicator. So let me make you able to share your screen. And then you should be able to do so now. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, and yes, as Nicole said, uh, Erin Ash is the uh, PI on this project, um, but she is going to have to step out in a few minutes and she didn't want to disrupt the flow. So um, I'm presenting this on behalf of, we have a pretty great team of uh, researchers at Oceans Initiative who have been doing a pilot study to help PSP as they come up with uh, an indicator around ocean noise. And as, as you all know, um, there is a new uh, indicator under the noise and marine waters uh, vital sign. And there are also substantial data gaps, particularly when you consider the quantity and quality of acoustic data that Canada is collecting um, over the last few years of Oceans Protection Plan funding relative to what we know in US um, waters, you know, Salish Sea and Puget Sound in particular. So we had this sort of two part goal, which is um, to offer some scientific advice, but what we think should be some good attributes of, a, of an, uh, an indicator and also just collect some data through a pilot study. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did uh, last summer um, and what we're doing next. And I'm repeating myself from the last presentation that Aaron gave, because I'm expecting that not everyone attended the first uh, time that we outlined our study design. But ultimately, you know, for a very modest budget, we realized very quickly we couldn't sample everywhere. Uh, this is a map of uh, marine traffic in uh, the Salish Sea and Puget Sound in particular itemized or broken down by, by vessel type, we knew we couldn't come up with a grid of 30 or 50 um, hydrophones to fit sort of a sound field map of um, noise levels in Puget Sound waters. But we thought if we take a mechanistic approach and we sample across that, great, that density gradient uh, of vessel traffic, we figure, you know, from first principles, you ought to be able to look at this map and identify some places that you hypothesize should be fairly quiet by the standards of Puget Sound and some that ought to be kind of noisy relative to the standards of, of Puget Sound without knowing what those standards are to begin with. So we took sort of a four part approach to sampling uh, with autonomous hydrophones. We wanted to sample across the range of ship and boat traffic. We wanted to complement the existing hydrophone networks uh, that we heard so much about in uh, Don's talk. Uh, we had to work within the logistical constraints, you know, that with the budget we had for this pilot study, we could only use a cable deployment of these sound traps, these autonomous hydrophones. If we had a bigger budget, we would have used ropeless release um, deployments and, and placed them more or less randomly. Um, and then we wanted to combine all these sites, all these uh, attributes into a ranking schemes so that we can say a priori which sites do we think ought to be noisiest and which sites do we think ought to be quietest? Um, so that in some sense it was testable. So you can't fit a model with you know, four or five data points, but it's informative when the four or five, when you get results from four or five uh, deployments, if they don't fit your expectations, that tells you your expectations are wrong. And if they do, uh, it tells you maybe you're onto something. So Kimberly and our team uh, downloaded the marine cadaster data, data um, AIS data at a one kilometer uh, grid cell resolution. And this was from May, June uh, of 2021, which is what was available when we were planning the study last year, and like ranked them from high to low um, based on ship traffic and boat traffic and vessel traffic combined. As I said, we wanted to complement the existing hydrophone network, um, recognizing that there are already long time series of data from Orca Sound and Port Townsend and Bush Point, uh, thanks to Orca Network and, and uh, Orca Sound and all the, the various uh, groups working on this. So effectively, we just thought, you know, sites that all other things being equal, sites that are near an existing cable hydrophone were kind of redundant, whereas sites that were distant from existing cabled hydrophones were sort of complementary and added value. Um, we also had this constraint about just in practical terms, we wanted to put them in using uh, 
a, a very inexpensive deployment system where you put a, a, a concrete block or two as, as your weight, um, and then 20 to 40 meters of rope with a buoy uh, to the surface. So that meant that we couldn't sample the deepest waters, which we would have liked to do. We also couldn't sample right in the very shallow waters. Um, and we were kind of in this Goldilocks range of about 20 to 40 meters of water depth. And you can see here that these are all the sites that are sort of anything that's shallower than 20 meters or deeper than 40 meters are clipped out of here. And so this is sort of what's within our range of sampling availability, given the time and the budget we had for this pilot study. And then we combined all these indicators, all these uh, um, attributes, so that um, all the, the cells that you see here uh, fall within that depth bin that worked. Um, and we ranked them in terms of vessel density and that complementarity versus redundancy um, to existing hydrophones, put them all together into a simple rank sum and um, sort of value of information, you can think of it in that way. Purple sites were maybe um, uh, are the places where we expected uh, sort of low priorities and, and yellow and high. And in this, this map here um, shows, allowed us to choose like a fairly long list of candidate sites where noisy areas, places that we thought should be noisy because they have lots of ships and lots of boats, those are in yellow. Um, some green blue areas are places that we thought should be intermediate or sort of average or typical of Puget Sound. And two purple sites that um, would have been um, what we expected to be the quietest, among the quietest sites within uh, Puget Sound. One of the conditions of our, our contract was that we had to run all this by the Navy, um, get feedback from this group and other groups. Um, we wanted to test the hypothesis that there should be a positive relationship between vessel traffic intensity and the mean noise level. So what we did is we just put out a bunch, I think 10 candidate sites and allowed people to vote. Um, and the five that, that won were Port Townsend Bay, um, the top left and Elliott Bay down by Seattle itself. Um, Case Inlet, which is in the lower left um, and Commencement Bay by Tacoma. There was a fifth site off Whidbey Island, but unfortunately um, we lost that hydrophone. So we never got the data back, but um, if you just look at that third column, what we expected is that from low to high, we expected Case Inlet to be the quietest, Port Townsend Bay, this is not right at the port, but um, a little bay off to the southwest of it, um, should be um, second quietest. And then Commencement Bay by Tacoma, we thought would be medium high traffic uh, and fairly noisy. And Elliott Bay is the one that we thought would be noisiest. Um, now, the small boats here, I, I just need to preface and caveat and say that we're, we're assuming that the AIS class B um, data in the Marine Cadaster website um, gives us a good representation of recreational boat traffic, but of course not all recreational boats carry AIS. So this is a good starting point for discussion. Um, so we're getting these back. These are the sound traps that we were deploying from our, um, our Zodiac last summer, um, again, that's sort of the, our expected ranking. Um, in addition, we wanted to complement our autonomous uh, weeks long deployments with spot recordings. So we gave uh, hydrophone kits with a hydrophone recorder, a speaker and a nice Pelican case, along with some training videos and one-on-one um, -on -one phone calls. Uh, we had colleagues from the Macaw tribe, John Sp Scordino and his friends, his colleagues uh, sent data near Nia Bay, which you can see on the left hand side. We have some great data coming back from uh, Everett Community College um, from the ORCA team. Uh, we, we sent kits to Rachel at Quiet Sound and um, Deep Green Wilderness who were sailing throughout the Salish Sea and up into Canadian waters and colleagues from Nisqually also offered to collect some data. Um, so waiting for some metadata and recordings to come back from those. And then we, we kind of came up with a safety net and designed, designed sort of a, a systematic survey. But if there were gaps left between either our, our cabled hydrophones, our autonomous hydrophones, the spot recordings that were coming from community scientists, we could try to fill in those gaps by going to one of these randomly selected transects um, and collect a, a spot recording. So far, we have 18 spot recordings at five locations. They're pretty biased towards the northern part. And I think in hindsight, we probably should have expected 
that busy people in a busy field season are not going to be able to tell us in real time whether they're sampling you know, that day in Northern or Central or South Puget Sound. So we still have some gaps to fill. Um, this just arrived in my inbox this morning from um, our team. And I wanna say ahead of time that the numbers on the y-axis will change because we still haven't gone through to, um, to check that we have the hydrophone sensitivities and the gain settings um, adequately corrected for. So don't compare among sites, but within a site, you know, if you look at Case Inlet in the lower left, you can see this beautiful dial pattern of day-night um, noise levels, um, no doubt driven by small boats being out during the day, um, whereas commercial traffic can, you know, run 24-7. And, and then if you look at Elliott Bay, which is the place we expected would be the noisiest, it's effectively smeared. You can still, if you squint hard enough, see that day-night pattern, um, but it's pretty dominated by ships. And certainly Commencement Bay in the top left down by Tacoma um, is, is more or less uh, uh, uniform with that day-night signal being masked. Um, and this little bay off Port Townsend turned out to be surprisingly quiet. So we're, we're Presenting summary uh, statistics, each one of these is a five minute sample. Um, we're also putting all the raw data, something like four terabytes of data onto a, a cloud server so that anyone can download and do whatever they'd like with it. Um, we still have some discussions we have to have. Like for example, this, uh, there's 160 dB measurement in Commencement Bay. I think that was our boat taking off really quickly just after we deployed it. So um, we might wanna take that one out. The analyses are ongoing. We've got you know a month or so to finish analysis, the sound trap recordings to quantify the inter and intra deployment variability. We're going to do long-term spectral averages of the four sound trap sites. We've got to finish uh, processing the spot recordings, but that will require a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with the data collectors. And then once the Navy has given us permission about any um, recordings they'd like us to hold back, um, we will put the final you know, giant uh, folder of wave files on a cloud server. Um, I think this might be one way, if we see a big gap between the observed and the expected values, this may be one way of telling whether small boats are actually um, contributing more than we would expect to the uh, local soundscape. Um, so I think that's um, going to be an interesting application of this in the coming weeks. Um, I think one of the things I learned is that unlike you know, an app where you just push a button, this was a really complicated study to include um, community scientists. And because the whole thing hinges so much on things like the gain settings on a digital recorder, um, that we might uh, need in future, if we did the study again, I think we should probably budget much more time for, for training um, and, and partnerships. And then I'd love, Scott, if, if there is the opportunity, it would be great to get comparable numbers from your cabled hydrophones so that we can at least try to see if our, our expected and our observed rankings um, correspond with seven dots rather than four, which would, which would nearly double our sample size. Um, the analyses are ongoing. I just wanna thank uh, PSP for the funding and all of our partners, uh, both on the community science side and lots of people who helped with the uh, autonomous sound trap deployments. Um, and Erin has put her uh, contact information if you have any questions. So thanks very much and I'll stop sharing now. Thanks, Rob. All right, we have about, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'm gonna open the floor, you can put it in chat and I'm happy to read it out or feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand if there's multiple. Questions? I have, I guess I have one, especially since we have some of the quiet sound folks here. Um, or maybe we did. Yeah, Rachel's still here. Great. Um, one thing I wanted to flag is that I, you know, there's an ongoing funded project by um, Quiet Sound to look at a gap analysis of the hydrophone networks in Washington state. And um, as we brainstorm about proposals, I think it's it's an interesting time to like try to coordinate with um, with NOAA around that. And you know part of the trick in indicators is leveraging you know existing data. And I'm super excited to see some of your initial results, Rob, but 
there's also the question of can we, you know, through some acoustic trickery and um, an innovation, like tap into some of the baselines you're referring to. So Orca Sound is one thought, but I, I know you're also Canadian. So I'm wondering if you've thought a little bit about ways we could use that gap analysis in Washington, but also think about the part of the world where you've published up in BC um, and coordinate efforts. Uh, maybe I'm thinking like the underwater listening stations that have been active and funded by the Port of Vancouver and the ONC hydrophones within the Strait of Georgia are just, they're just interesting time series that have been very consistent. And as you pointed out, well-funded. Do you have some thoughts on whether we could leverage time series other than Orca Sound um, history in other parts of, of Puget Sound and maybe even, you know, Strait of Georgia? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if, I don't think the NOAA gap analysis part of your question was directed to me, um, but the leveraging part. Um, yeah, I, I, I just saw a really neat paper by um, Spinebagel and Sheila Thornton, and I've forgotten the name of the first author who published a paper on lost communication space and echolocation space um, for Southern resident killer whales in the Salish Sea on the Canadian side of Salish Sea. Um, it's, the analyses are re remarkably similar to ones that we published with Chris Clark um, when we deployed um, pop-ups from, which are autonomous, big autonomous uh, hydrophones from the BC Alaska border down to the BC Washington border in 2008, nine and 10. And it would be really interesting to see, given all of the management effort to slow ships down um, and to move boats farther from, from killer whales to get small boats to slow down when they're in important killer whale habitats, are we actually um, moving the dial in terms of the proportion of uh, communication space that's being lost? So that's a great, you know, to me, that's a, a great time series to compare the 2008 10 to 2020 whatever was in you know in the recent paper um just because there has been so much management you know attention paid to mitigation during that time it's also a great one because you know so as you know better than anyone you know better than i do comparing among sites when you're using different kinds of hydrophones different recording systems different calibration settings um that can comparing the absolute values over time can be very difficult. Whereas looking at lost communication space, which is such a biologically meaningful metric for Southern resident killer whales, that's really just a numerator and a denominator. And because it's in, in relative terms, it's proportion. Um, I think that would be one that I would love to see compared um, through time. In terms of who would fund it, um, I don't know. But I think as we all look to, you know, as Chris Clark says, you know, sometimes the answer is not putting out one more hydrophone or measuring noise level to the third decimal place. It's trying to understand what it means to foraging ecology of southern resident killer whales or to their acoustic habitat quality. Um, and I think those are the directions where I'd like to see a little bit more funding placed into where the noise hits the whale. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, Rachel, do, do you have any news about the any updates for us on on the gap analysis project? Sure. So, uh, just since some folks may not have heard of this gap analysis, um, it is a uh, it is not a quiet sound run project. Uh, the Port of Seattle is working on an interlocal agreement with NOAA and UW to conduct a gap analysis of Washington's current hydrophone capacity and identify where uh, more hydrophones could or should be built uh, for the purpose of Southern resident killer whale conservation. Uh, so that's the sort of specific lens for this hydrophone gap analysis. Um, Unfortunately, on our website, it says that this gap analysis is due to be completed early 2023. And uh, actually, it hasn't even started yet, um, which is, to my understanding, due to the complexities of interlocal agreements. Um, Quiet Sound is an advisor to this project, and I think we'll be doing some work to coordinate maritime and southern resident killer whale expertise 
into um, into the process. Uh, so it's coming. <laughs> more to come, and I think more updates um, for this group in the future. Thanks, Rachel. Um, the other thing, since we have a somewhat international group today, I wanted to ask about is um, I noticed on the um, OceanWise website recently that they're hiring folks to help with a, something called the Noise Tracker Project. And I wondered if any of our Canadian colleagues knew anything about that. Um, just reading through the job description, it looks like there's some technical groups that are thinking about noise metrics in Canada and ways to standardize them across the BC hydrophone network, which I think of as inspiration, at least part of it was inspiration for the Orca Sound hydrophone network. So um, that's the other opportunity I see this year around and possibly around the, um, a, a follow-on project to your great work, Rob, is just trying to coordinate a little bit in a transboundary sense at the same time we're looking at the gaps and the opportunities that could help us establish a baseline for this local indicator. Anyone, I think, yeah, anyone um, heard of the Noise Tracker Project? Is that your? I'll, I'll bite, Scott. Um, I, I don't know anything about the Noise Tracker um, initiative, but I'd love to hear more if, if anyone here can weigh in. Um, but I think I just, I, I, I'd, I'd welcome um, the conversation about standardizing metrics. I, I guess I just want to, I, I I guess my my antenna go up when I hear people talking about getting a baseline for this area, because we've been talking about getting a baseline now. Most of us who've been doing this for a while, you know, since two thousand two, um, and in the, those twenty years, you know, this population has declined from ninety eight to seventy three. Um, so, if ever there were a population for which we have established a baseline, um, it seems to me that this is it. Um, we can take the um, the raw acoustic files and decide whether we want to do a broadband noise level or an audiogram weighted level or third octave band levels, or um, do we want to do this in terms of lost communication space or the probability of eliciting a behavioral response. Um, but those are all conversions effectively that you can do from one metric to another from the same raw sound files uh, and some simple behavioral models, um, which have all been published for many, many years. And I think. Um, I guess I just want to, I, I guess I have been seeing uh, this field go from um, shiny object to shiny object. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, I, we look at what ECHO is doing, what, you know, what WDFW is doing, what um, uh, Quiet Sound is doing, and encourage um, efforts to reduce noise, you know. And maybe in parallel, we can see do our metrics change and do they capture that change? Um, but I'm reminded, I guess, of you know, that project that you and I did for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, when we went back to the autolite tracks of southern resident killer whales from 2003, 4, and 5, and looking at how the changes in, in the number and speed and approach distance of small boats, how that changed from then to 2018. And in all that time, even though boats were farther away, because they were always in gear, um, the noise levels didn't drop. So we spent 15 years you know, as President Obama would say, admiring the problem and not fixing it. Um, and so I, I guess I just really want to make sure that we have that in mind because it can be very tempting when you see all these dots on a map saying, well, Canada has 20 hydrophones and they're catching, you know, doing a petabyte of data a year. At some point, if a petabyte of data a year is not enough to answer your question, you ought to rethink the question. Um, we're getting a lot of data here um, and the whales are still declining. Sorry, that I, I don't know. I don't know what it. I don't know what prompted that. Just a caution, mm -hmm. a cautionary tale that we can we can worry about metrics, or we could just pick the Vancouver Aquarium workshop report that you and Kathy Heisey and others wrote, and just say summarize them however you want. Do all of them. <laughs> report all the metrics you want. Um, mm -hmm. What matters is are they getting? Are we managing in such a way that they're making life better for killer whales? Thanks, Rob. 
I just wanted to, I know Alejandro, you had your hand up, just wanted to revisit that in case you did have a question and if not, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, no, I think Rob answered it in his final, final comments. It was related to that big picture comment that he made. I'm good, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks again, Rob. Hope you're sticking around. Um, we're gonna be talking about some potential proposals that I think it would be great to, to have your input on. So we're gonna go on to the ORCA occupancy indicator update. So I'm gonna hand it off to Corey. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. So I'll just give a, a brief update. Um, last Tuesday, we had our first of two workshops to talk about a new ORCA occupancy vital sign indicator uh, and really what this indicator could look like and what questions it could help answer or decisions that it could help inform. Uh, so great first workshop and was really pleased to see many of you there. Uh, this first one really focused on sharing data sources, uh, exploring some opportunities or limitations for those sources, and then also brainstorming the purpose of this new indicator. So as part of that, we heard presentations too from a few people and thank you to those of you who are on this meeting now and presented for us. So really, I just want to invite the group, um, those of you who were at the workshop, would anyone like to share any reflections of how it went with this group? Um, anything you'd like to share or raise, raise today? Okay, if anything comes up, feel free to drop it in the chat. I uh, just want to let you know that the next workshop is planned for March 20th, so you should already have that on your calendars, um, but if you don't and you're interested in coming, um, then please let me know. You can drop a note in the chat now or send me an email. Um, I also want to share the online discussion tool that we used. This is going to be open through Wednesday of this week, so if anyone missed the workshop, uh, wants to revisit the discussion, uh, feel free to add anything that you'd like in the mural board that we used. So I will add that to the chat now. Um, let me know if you have any questions, happy to answer them and thanks. Thank you, Corey. All right, Scott. Yes, I have one thought. I'm not sure how many folks here were participating. So, um, but I know Jared missed it. So I'm, I'm excited to say that it was really cool to use the Miro tool and to get input asynchronously from everybody. Um, I haven't had time to go through all of it, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the distillation. But it was that was an interesting process, and um, thank you, Monica, for presenting. That was honestly really exciting to see like the track data that's coming out of your efforts and the efforts of Orca Network, and I just see a very bright future for not just Southern residents and big scale rails, but you know, I think whatever we build for occupancy metrics for the killer rail ecotypes, if we build it right and we build it in an open way, um, it's going to be very useful for the other um, species. And you know, we haven't paid, I think as a community, not all of us have paid equal attention to the killer whale versus other sightings um, and, and hearings. So anyways, it's exciting. I think the door is opening to movement modeling locally for each of those species because of the, the, the resolution of the data that could underpin an occupancy metric. And so I'm, I'm excited to keep the conversation going because I, I think that the broader goals of, of PSIMP and monitoring efforts, uh, transboundary monitoring efforts are really likely to benefit from whatever we, we do around the, the occupancy metrics. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Anything else, Corey? That is it. Thanks, Nicole. Okay. Thank you. All right. Running a little behind, but that's totally fine. We have some buffer at the end. So we're going to move on to the monitoring to accelerate recovery RFI portion of the agenda. Um, we're going to start by having Katrina Radic from the partnership present just a really uh, brief overview of the timeline and requirements of the RFI. And just a reminder to folks, um, we won't be answering any specific questions during this presentation. I'll provide some additional opportunities for you to ask specific questions. I think there's an open um, 
uh, open question and answer is open right now until March 9th. So I'll share that resource with everyone. But then we'll just we'll get that overview and then go into some past proposal efforts from membership, um, really reflecting on any lessons learned from the previous funding round, and then enter into our discussion uh, centered on opportunities for collaboration around potential proposals. So with that, I'll hand it off to Katrina. You should be able to share your screen. Great, thanks, Nicole, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just like Nicole mentioned, I'm slightly bound by the amount of information I can share since it is a live solicitation, but I did just put a link into the chat that takes you all to the Monitoring to Accelerate Recovery webpage, which includes uh, links to the webinar recording. So if you want to see the full slide deck and questions that people ask during that webinar, please do take a few minutes to go through that uh, recording. And plus it has a capture of all the information plus the solicitation itself uh, included at that link. Um, but in brief, let me try to screen share real quick. Um, I'll just quickly go over what the two categories are for monitoring to accelerate recovery. I may uh, selfishly not go full into uh, presentation view so I can find the slides um, to go with you all. And again, these slides are from the webinar itself. So if you're curious about what's in the other content information that I won't get to today, I encourage you all to go to the recordings. Um, so monitoring to accelerate recovery, um, we've usually usually like named it vital signs and PSEMP related funding. Um, this is sort of our funding pot, but again, acknowledging that there's several other funding opportunities, not just hosted by the partnership. So um, looking to you all as potential proposers to find what best aligns with your interests. But again, given that this is a, the Marine Mammals Work Group and PSAMP, you know, it seems very um, ripe for probably whatever ideas that you all uh, come up with um, would make sense to go into um, this potential funding opportunity. Um, so this RFP or RFI, I should say, has two categories, one of which is category one, which is developing and uh, for first time recording of vital sign indicators. So there's a very specific list in the solicitation that outlines which indicators that they're looking for in, uh, interest in to develop out. Category two is a much more broader um, and wider encompassing category. Um, that's really asking uh, folks to think about what are some of those connections related to the action agenda and the action agenda is quite broad and vast um, to make those linkages, but this is sort of typically connected to synthesis, um, evaluation, effectiveness, those kind of products very much fit al and align well within the category, category two uh, process. Um, each proposal must clarify which categories that they're trying to apply for. So you have to be strictly in category one or category two. For those that remember last year's uh, funding or the last cycle's funding opportunity, we allowed folks to say one or two. That is not the case for this um, solicitation cycle. Um, and then other thing that I wanted to flag for folks is that this we are asking folks to think intentionally about collaboration. Um, the way that this solicitation is set up, um, it is really uh, important that collaboration is a part of your proposal and your process. So asking folks to think really intentionally about that and it should be reflected very well within your proposal. Um, um, I guess the last little tidbit that I think I really want to highlight for folks before you all get into discussions is the, the timeline, like Nicole noted. Um, so exciting fact that we made this recent uh, adjustment to have another addendum come out. So there will be um, a, Q a second Q&A officially with the solicitation. So if you have questions and I acknowledge I cannot answer them today please do submit your um, questions and answers to uh, PSP contracts um, at psp.wa.gov. Um, I'll put that link into the chat momentarily um, for the second Q&A period, um, which will wrap up on the 9th, and then we'll release a second um, Q&A publicly for everyone to see those answers to those questions. You'll also see that um, part of all solicitations now from the partnership and uh, many other state agencies that fall underneath that um, Healthy Environments for All, or also known as HEAL Act, um, that we have to have a certain amount of funding connected to um, 
environmental justice. So there is a chance that we may come out with another addendum um, around March 10th timeline from the Environmental Justice Council that may provide further guidance. Um, so just adding a slight note and caveat there. But the big timeline that I wrote and deadline that I want folks to be aware of is that April 14th, um, which is the final due date for folks uh, to get that submitted in. Um, and then from there, between April to May, we have the evaluation panel, which is going to be comprised mostly of uh, PSAM steering committee members and then also um, a few other um, partners that are going to be participating on the panel will help review those solicitation or those proposals. And then we should have a response back to all proposals uh, by May 26. So that's very high level. Again, encourage folks to take a few minutes to take a look at that. But um, the exciting part is that what I'm saying to you all is that you all will have the next so many minutes left in this meeting to talk about collaboration, find those partnership and opportunities, which again is really vital to um, this funding opportunity. So with that said, I will put a link to, uh, if you have, uh, I will put an email link for you all um, for if you do have questions and I cannot answer them today, please do send an email to um, PSP contracts, which again, I will put into the chat um, to make it in time for that second addendum to have all of your questions um, hopefully answered in time so that you all can create a, a great proposal. With that said, I will stop screen sharing and I will pass it back to Nicole. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was a really helpful overview before we get into the conversation here about collaboration on potential proposals for this RFI. So really appreciate it. And with that, I know we said, um, there aren't, we're not gonna open it up to a Q&A about this proposal, uh, or RFI, but one of the things we wanted to do before we enter into our discussion about potential proposals and collaborations is just ask some members to speak to their past experience in the previous funding round about any lessons learned or um, considerations to bring forward into this funding round. So with that, I'm gonna call on a few folks I was able to um, touch base with before this meeting. And Monica, I saw you uh, get on video. So I'll start with you. Just an overview of your previous proposal, um, any lessons learned, and, and looking forward to this round. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, so we had applied during the last funding cycle to uh, try and help develop this ORCA occupancy indicator. And um, that proposal was not successful with the last go round and kind of there were sort of two main pieces of feedback that I took away from the debrief on that. Um, one was really, you know, trying to uh, increase our emphasis on the justice, equity, diversity and inclusion aspect of it. Um, and so I think that's one thing that we can, you know, continue working on and, and talk about how to improve. And then while we had um, six organizations that were kind of bought in to collaborate on this proposal uh, during the workshop that happened um, last week, I think we identified something like 18 potential data sources. Um, so while six felt like a good number at the time, the feedback was really, you know, broaden that collaboration even further. Um, I really liked Rachel's term of uh, the complexity of interlocal agreements. <laughs> I think um, I think that's one of the real issues that we face and it's going to be important to have those conversations to kind of move forward for a a broader collaboration towards something like developing the orca occupancy indicator so those those two pieces of feedback were kind of my takeaway messages from uh the last go round thanks monica susan uh yes hi um and our our proposal we only got through the LOI stage and that was not accepted so um although we were partners on or one of the collaborators on Monica's um we were looking at um sorry my cat has to always be part of zoom meetings um we were looking at um collaborating with Washington tribal members and schools um and um, urban areas that are um, less likely to get out to see whales. Um, our main project being our whale sighting network and how to get um, more interest and participation from 
um, an increased um, diversity of participants. Um, we also addressed reaching more boaters in Puget Sound um, and including, you know, teaching people, getting people outside, uh, learning about the orcas, then becoming um, community scientists by providing data that's then used by um, all sorts of agencies and researchers. Um, so one of our, our goals was to more actively um, reach out to under schools in underserved communities, um, in involving people of color in watching and reporting whales, working with tribes, schools, the fishing community, canoe clubs to report whale sightings. Um, so it was basically looking at ways to expand our, um, our whale sighting network the, the and information we put out and the data we bring in from a more diverse audience. But we didn't get past the LOI stage. So, and we had um, tribes, the Coast Guard Auxiliary um, as partners and um, who else? Uh, Resolve Conservation in Orca Sound and Beam Reach, um, who are all collaborating with on data sharing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, thanks. Thanks, Susan. Sure. And I know, so Scott, I believe you submitted a proposal. And then we also have Rob, who submitted a successful proposal that could sh share some lessons learned as well, if you're willing, Rob. We'll start yeah. with Scott. Thanks. Um, my experience is from the first biennium when, when these RFPs started to manifest. So it was pretty early. And I, I think I'd categorize the proposal that um, I worked the hardest on with Resolve Conservation was for the Sakarsha Data Cooperative. Um, and it's sort of a category two, it was an integrative effort. Um, at the time when things like the Puget Sound dashboard for visualizing um, not real time, but close to real time estuarine circulation got funded. Um, so uh, I don't unfortunately have too much to add in terms of process other than make sure you follow the length requirements um, to the extent they're specified because it we were not careful and we were a little bit over on length and so we didn't get meaningful feedback, unfortunately. Thanks, Scott. Got to pay attention to the technicalities. <laughs> Rob? Well, uh, you know, I don't know what to say really um, okay. about mm -hmm. uh, monitoring to accelerate recovery. Uh, mm -hmm. Our experience was obviously very positive. The, the presentation I just gave um, was from a successful application. Um, I think my impression is that, you know, we had, we, we kind of had it easy compared to some of the things like orca occupancy and some of the other indicators, because it's just, you know, going out, we, we think of noise as a very complicated thing, but if we were talking about, you know, climate change and we offered to give a bunch of people thermometers, we wouldn't say that that was rocket science. And so we had a pretty high probability of success. I think that's that's fair in the sense that, not that our project would change the indicator or, or be wildly successful, but we knew we were, we were likely to be able to collect data because we were just going to drop hydrophones and bring them back and then put them all in the cloud and let other people have access to them. So I think on that sense, we had, um, we, 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 we had an easier, it was easier for us to build the case for the need for the science um, than it would have been if we were talking about something that was um, a bit more nuanced. We were also very lucky in that, you know, our colleagues in Canada had done so much of the groundwork um, that we could just effectively say, this is, this is the, um, um, this is sort of the trend. This is where management is going. We could, we could build on this having been part of the uh, technical advisory committee at um, when ECHO first started its uh, ship slowdown, having been one of the science advisors on Southern Resident Killer Whales, I was able to say this is sort of the, the history of uh, the narrative of how that ECHO ship slowdown project 
um, started and developed. And although we couldn't know at the time what quiet sound was going to need, we kind of knew roughly what elements um, of noise measurements quiet sound was likely to need. And so we were in the right, we were proposing to do, I think, the right thing at the right time. We had a really solid team, Asila Bergman, who is a former employee of ours who's moved on to bigger and greater things now, um, wrote it, you know, helped us write a fantastic proposal on a technical level. Um, and then we had great letters of support from mm -hmm. the five people we mentioned um, who offered to use them. And then also from Scott, who said, sure, you bet. My, um, I've been holding my hydrophones together with bubble gum and duct tape and five bucks a year. <laughs> um, we could sure use your help finding out how much they may have drifted out of calibration. So I think the, those were the elements. And I think probably the, the final thing was that I think we recognized that it wasn't our place to define the indicator. So we would just come up with data and participate in discussions like this as PSP, as the group as a whole decided to come up with the indicator. Um, we'd be happy to bring our science and our expertise to that, but we didn't presume to say would go away and work in a vacuum and come up with the indicator. I hope that makes sense. I think those are, oh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, just one more quick thought, Nicole. I know you want to get to the mural, but um, thinking about Monica's question um, and also remembering one thing we did for an integrative project like a category two project that is maybe really big and I ideally should involve 20 or 30 partners including transboundary ones I think we we made a good decision we didn't get good feedback on it but I, to break your big project into phases that are sort of two-year chunks with enough groups that the size of the grant is meaningful to everybody um, but that's the challenge, and it's and I'll say this with the PSEMP steering committee members here is is that PSEMP is big, and and if you include everybody, the funding pot gets divided by a large number, and so that's a challenge that we'll have to face over the next couple of biennia is is doing grand things, but and with the right number of collaborators, that's a we can talk about that more, but that's we broke it into a phase with Orca Network, Beam Reach, which is Orca Sound, basically as the primary partners in a sub-region of Puget Sound. Like, well, let's start this here and then try to grow it later. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that reflection, Scott. And uh, thanks for being put on the spot and um, sharing your experience, Rob. That was really helpful insight. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen. How we're gonna use Mural is a little different than how we've used it um, the past, uh, fall meeting, and if you attended the ORCA occupancy indicator, we're going to be using it kind of like as a, a virtual whiteboard um, to facilitate discussion, but won't be having folks go into it themselves. So, right, you should be able to see my screen now. And before we start, you know, thinking about specific proposal ideas, I think a good question just to answer in your head or um, you could answer in chat or thumbs up, whatever you prefer. Is is your organization um, open to collaboration on a proposal? And is it something that you're actively seeking? Are you interested in being a collaborator and not a lead on a proposal? Um, you can be a collaborator kind of on a limitless number of proposals. Um, but you can only lead one. It's one of the requirements. And then we'll be walking through these um, below, but other questions to consider are, are you submitting a proposal that has a data need or gap that others could provide insight on? So asking um, where would collaboration be most helpful for you on a potential proposal? What does strong collaboration look like for a monitoring related project? What would you be asking of your potential collaborators? Um, how do you see those being presented in the proposal? And what are potential next steps that would enable collaboration on a proposal you are submitting? So what needs to happen? Um, are potential collaborators in this room right now? You have to reach out to them. Um, are there other networks that we could utilize to to bridge those collaborations. So as you're thinking through that, the next 
phase of the discussion and where the discussion will really start is in terms of creating, so we created these umbrella categories to help facilitate the discussion for potential proposal ideas. One being, um, we have some great momentum from the ORCA occupancy indicator um, workshops to potentially submit a proposal for ORCA occupancy monitoring. So we're gonna start discussing potential proposal ideas here, potential collaboration needs and next steps. We've also had a presentation today on monitoring noise um, and other acoustic related proposals. So is there another proposal that could be possible? And what that could look like um, related to just um, kind of the Southern resident killer whale population, um, getting more information and data on pod numbers and ancillary measures like fecundity and body condition. Potentially developing a dashboard or visual visualization data collection, the steps that would be required to do that and potential other categories, if anyone has any ideas about that. Um, this is really an open discussion, so feel free to unmute yourself and I think we'll uh, create a line if there there's multiple people looking to, to answer questions. So before we start on this uh, first category, just wanna ask, are there other potential categories that we should consider speaking to today? Any thoughts about how this, this discussion is organized? And I might ask Corey to help me out if there are any hands being raised or, or messages in the chat. Nothing yet, Nicole. One, one nuance about the ORCA, the ORCA occupancy proposals, uh, hypothetically, is that um, you could separate them into Southern Resident Killer Whale a proposal and a BIGS proposal. Um, I'm not sure that's a good idea, but I could imagine that happening. So something to consider. And Nicole, do you want folks to be interacting on, on Miro directly or? No, so really um, encouraging folks to raise their hand. Francis, I see you just raised your hand, um, but we're gonna see just how open dialogue discussion works. And if it doesn't, we can, we'll take that into consideration for, for next time. Francis? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to raise the point. I was reviewing the mural board from last week's workshop this morning and, I think there were some really important points that were made on that board um, about the fundamentals of what this orca occupancy is all about. And I think before those questions are answered, it's, I would argue, probably a little hard to move forward with that. So, I mean, I would just caution that, that we might want to address some of those key concerns and questions first. Mm -hmm. Nicole, if I could, if I could respond to that a little okay. bit. Um, Francis, thank you for that. And that's definitely something that we've been thoughtful about in our timing for the ORCA occupancy indicator workshops. Um, we wanted to make sure we could have that second conversation on in March before these proposals are due. Um, so thanks for flagging that for us. And I um, just want to plant that seed too, that there will be that chance for that second conversation. Um, but noting that doesn't leave too much time for proposal development from March 20th to the due date. So as many early conversations as we can, can, we can encourage, um, that's part of the goal here. Thanks, Corey. Rob? Yeah, I, I had a very minor point about the second column and wanted to, or sorry, the third. Um, I mean, strictly speaking, I guess it, if if you've got fecundity in in parentheses there, by definition, that that's actually population by pod, right? Um, because you'd be adding one new 
mm. individual to the population or not. But I would put the ancillary measures, I would put be behavior in there. And I've heard Scott ask us to consider standardizing um, our ethograms, our, our, definite, our definitions of behavioral state. Um, so I, I would put behavior in there. And fecundity, I guess I think of as a population level metric. Mm. Um, but on Francis's point, I just wanted to reiterate that. And I think, um, Francis, I was probably one of those people who commented in tried to put a complex idea in a tiny little sticker on a mural that was moving faster than I could keep up with. Um, and so I think my comments were probably unhelpful. But now that Don has just presented on the Aleutian Isle um, incident, I think there's actually an, an analogy here um, with that's really super relevant to occupancy. Um, whatever the index is, whether it's probability of occurrence or density or distribution or abundance or occupancy, it's going to be somewhere in that that constellation. Imagine if the Aleutian Isle were happening right now and we only had data from Puget Sound. Um, we didn't know what was happening on the west side of San Juan Island. If we knew that the whales were present in Puget Sound, if that's all the information we had, um, are we implicitly assuming that therefore the whales are not by San Juan Island and swimming through the oil spill? And I think on a bigger picture scale, when we think of Canada and the US, uh, BC and Washington state, all adjusting um, noise and disturbance and making spatially explicit decisions based on data like this, occupancy or opportunistic sightings um, or some sort of effort corrected sightings, it really matters if we're telling ships, you know, the whales are in Puget Sound and therefore ships should slow down. Are we somehow sending the message that the whales are therefore not in Juan de Fuca and Canada doesn't have to invoke its lateral displacement trial? Um, something like that, I, I think, as I think Francis, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what you were alluding to that we somehow haven't defined how do you deal with the, the spatial and temporal bias with presence only data. And if you only look at the presence, there is somehow this implicit message to, to stakeholders and, and managers that if they're, if they're seen in one place, there are zeros everywhere else and, and not, we're not looking everywhere else. Is that what you were saying, Francis? Uh, yeah, I think it was um, some of those and also just being clear on what our nomenclature is on what actually is the definition of, of occupancy. So I think there are some fundamentals there. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't had much time to kind of digest or think about much more of this stuff. And like you, Rob, the tiny stickers flying around the screen wasn't conducive. <laughs> to thought. And, and maybe, um, maybe that's the point is that there, there is some request for information and guidance on what we think a good occupancy indicator should be. And maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't use that exact term. Um, yeah, maybe Nicole and Corey can correct me, but I think what I've been hearing from the partnership and PSEMP on this RFI is that um, for any given indicator within the vital signs, there's sort of multiple phases you can go through. There's the initial scoping, which is I think sort of what you've just done, Rob, you and Aaron for the noise indicator. And then there's a method methodology phase where you're proposing by what methods, over what geography and what time scale might you compute this indicator. Um, and then there's the actual funding of the reporting and ongoing um, work. So for the occupancy one, I, I think we're somewhere in phase one and a proposal could be about phase two. Um, speaking to your good point, Frankie, um, it, but it might be different for, for a different indicator. Um, but these are the, of the ones that we are working on or could propose or collaborate on a proposal or pre pretty early stage. Um, and but I will flag that in my look, I haven't looked at every indicator in the vital signs, but almost all of them are annual. So we sort of, you should probably, that's maybe another thing you could distinguish in the yellow stickies, Nicole, is like a lot of the data that's coming in that could inform an annual occupancy could be used with sort of 
dynamic management stuff that Rob's talking about. Um, and and it comes with those implicit concerns about what, what presence absence data really means for a region other than where the data point is. Um, so in my mind, like Monica's in her paper has done a nice job of defining what occupancy means to her, but um, there are lots of ways you could do it. And, and the geography question is a big one. You know, sh should this be for the Salish Sea? Should it be for Puget Sound proper south and east of Admiralty Inlet or subregions that match the salmon indicators that are also revised? There's a lot of choices there. And so I hope the process I'm, I'm hoping that at least one of the proposals is, a, you know, will guide us through a process that lets us think about some of those, the nomenclature and the, and the methodo methodological choices, which are hard. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, and you're correct that there are multiple um, phases that are outlined in the RFI, and all of them are in need for ORCA occupancy. So that, that initial um, scoping is a need, and that could be a potential um, proposal for category one in this in regards to this RFI. Francis, yeah, um, I don't know if I maybe missed something here. Very likely, so I apologize. Um, is this, are we just looking for proposals for Southern resident killer whales or can we look at potential projects involving other marine mammal species as well, given that this is the marine mammal working group? Yeah, great. You know, I got to put great out the question. <laughs> great question. Um, because this conversation is centered around the monitoring to accelerate recovery RFI, we're kind of bound by the vital signs and indicators um, for okay. the Puget Sound. But we're not necessarily, there are other species that are indicator species like Pacific herring and eelgrass and they tie oh. into other species. So I'm like, yeah. I look at this from a much broader picture than yeah, and that's one target species. Yeah, great perspective and point. Uh, and Scott, do you have any thoughts on that? Or... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if this is the right biennium for it. Mm -hmm. But I, um, you know, part of what we built in Akarsha Data Cooperative was, you know, being agnostic to the the marine species. The thought there was that a new way of storing and sharing animal location data might open the door to, you know, not only computing occupancy in a more collaborative way, but also using the same software that, and, you know, reproducible scientific process that you're going to use to, to compute your occupancy metrics. Like, it would be nice if you could just change the species and then compute occupancy for other species that the work group cares about, but the vital signs don't. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and there, there's an opportunity there. And Maybe that's sort of an integration, like it's a category two kind of, or, or maybe it would strengthen a proposal about occupancy if you made reference to some of those other indicators and the like trophic connections between them. Um, so that the dashboard idea could also um, leverage the fact that some of the state is coming in faster than annually. I think there's mm -hmm. opportunities there. I'm just not sure if they're going to strengthen a proposal or weaken it on this, this iteration. Right. I guess a question I have for this group is, are, is anyone considering a proposal um, to submit for this RFI? Is it a little too early to, to know if you are or not? Um, and if you're considering it, what would be some helpful discussion that we can have right now. And Susan, I saw you go on video. <laughs> yeah, I just, one thought and something brought up by another staff member when this came out was that a lot of this data is already out there. I mean, we have two decades of 
of monitoring data on orcas um, and uh, you know other species, and and yet I I don't feel like we will we'll have a good chance of getting this. Um, so I'm doubting we're going to apply. Um, we would probably agree to be partners um, with other groups, but I don't know. I I guess um, I've seen the part been with the partnership through my last job and then 20 years with Orca Network and seen it evolve and and it's good to see some funding opportunities being presented again but yet I'm I feel like there's um, just some disconnect between the data that is already out there and we make our data readily available we give it mm -hmm. to different agencies um, so I guess I I'm just kind of concerned about the reinventing the wheel and, um, you know, maybe it will help if we all trying to put in a proposal together and we're all partners rather than competing with each other. Although, you know, that's what we, we attempted to do last year or last round, but those are just some thoughts bouncing around in my head. Yeah, thanks, Susan. So it sounds like, yeah, the need to data share um could help orca occupancy monitoring proposals or others uh francis well just just a point that these proposals will be competing with proposals coming from not just all the other working groups but all the other organizations working towards the recovery of of puget sound so it is competitive and i think having you know your competitive science based proposals and proposals that are implementing that science is going to be really important. Thanks, Francis. Caitlin? Hi, all. Um, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Caitlin O'Moro. I use she, her pronouns, and I work with Rachel Aronson on the Quiet Sound program. Um, and I just wanted to offer that um, you know, Quiet Sound has heard the question multiple times um, for when we uh, get our vessels to slow down, what is the actual behavior change in the whales? Um, and I know that's something that we know that the community is thinking about and something that is very important to our work. So I think we're just trying to think through, is this a space under category two of this proposal that that question can move forward this time around um, or not? Uh, we would need to collaborate with people in order to do the uh, science part of the work. Um, but I think that's just something we are contemplating at the moment. Thanks, Galen. So I'm hearing a potential proposal idea um, could relate to, to Southern resident killer whale behavior and the response to slowing down of vessels. Yeah, specifically to our... Um, our voluntary vessel slowdown program that we just had the first trial of this last fall and winter. Um, and um, if we do that again, um, you know, the whales were sighted within our slowdown area for a little less than half the time that the slowdown was in effect, um, which is cool to see the overlap. And so a, a, a significant question is, well, the whales were there. What did they do if and when um, a vessel slowed down while they were present? So yeah, potential um, need for that proposal is folks to conduct the the behavior monitoring or absolutely like yeah mm -hmm. and and to be honest, you know, Quiet Sound is still considering on our end what our capacity is as far as being a lead or not on something like this at this time. Um, so just in the very initial stages of ideas and potentially chatting with folks. Mm -hmm. I have to jump, jump in and just say, it's great to hear you say that, Caitlin. Um, you know, Rob and I have, during all the funding of the slowdowns trials up in Canada in the Harrow Strait, um, tried hard to make sure that was a priority from and and 
it's, we've done okay on it. Rob, I'm sure you can chime in on this, but um, I think it's really important to not miss those opportunities if possible. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, the idea of standardizing an ethergram for Southern residents at least, and building that into some of the community science networks, which I think are increasingly capable and in taking ID quality photos from shore. Um, that might be a way to strengthen an occupancy proposal and a stepping store, stone towards more quantitative um, measures like theodolite studies or photogrammetry, but um, I hadn't really thought about a separate proposal. Um, and I, I just also wanted to flag that the fecundity and body condition came out of the revision process. Um, I actually don't know who suggested fecundity, so that's interesting that you flagged it as potentially redundant, Rob. Um, but the body condition could be spoken to by any of the folks who are doing drone-based work, like um, John or Holly, for example, or the, the Center for Whale Research. So, I mean, those are potential partners too, I think. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Scott, Rob? just to, sorry, just to clarify, did I understand you correctly that because the headers of this column came out of a, a consultative process, we can't we can't add behavior in there. Sorry, no, I didn't mean to say you couldn't add. I was just remembering your point about fecundity and yeah. wanted to point out that body cushion and fecundity were these things called ancillary measures, which didn't make it to become indicators within the ORCA vital sign, but were flagged as like potentially valuable, worth some sort of support someday. Um, and possibly in the next revision process, ripe for incorporation into the vital sign. Got it. And and that, yeah, so I guess that makes it um, a challenge or, or a neat opportunity because actually, you know, are they foraging could fall within, you know, column one of the occupancy. Are they there and what are they doing? It could fall under number two in terms of noise, in terms of, there should be an adaptive management component that looks at the effectiveness of the management, you know, mitigation measure, or it could come under three as a another ancillary southern resident killer whale uh, measure that maybe hasn't been named explicitly, but it's the direction we're all headed in. Lots of collaborations there. That's a cool. That's a cool observation. Yeah. And just curious in response to what Caitlin shared as a potential proposal, if there's any um, folks on the call that know a strong potential collaborator um, that, that could be involved in that and building it out more. Rob? I, I'm happy to put a link in the chat um, to the paper I published with um, colleagues from SMRU Consulting and um, and uh, Simon Fraser and others for the ECHO program when the when we did the monitoring effectiveness in Harrow Strait. So when ships slow down in Harrow Strait, um, you could see a demonstrable decrease in noise level um, at lime kiln. But what we did is then translated that into killer whale behavior and showed that when the whales slow down or when the ships slow down and made less noise. The whales increase their probability of feeding. So I, I think anyone on that team would, would welcome a collaboration. Much appreciated. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And we'll be sure to capture that in your all. I'll just I'm just scanning through our participant list at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's there's lots of potential collaborators, Caitlin. Um, you know, there's an amazing paper about the reduction in stress hormones in North Atlantic right whales during the 9-11 shutdown. And, and you have Giles on, um, on the call right now. So looking at stress hormones is a different angle, um, trying to understand that whether your noise reduction mitigation is, is effective. Um, and there's other folks who've done, done work um, that may be relevant, whether it's uh, photogrammetry, you can sort of observe behavior from photos as opposed to the theodolites. 
or from yeah vessel based research focal follows so yeah and of course there's you know rob's work from bluffs like you could be on um, around admiral Inlet. rob and aaron's work is also certainly relevant And we have about nine minutes left here. So just want to revisit any other potential proposal ideas that someone wants to bring forward for just to notify the group that this is being considered. They're searching for potential collaborators to strengthen their proposal, um, whether it's in these categories or or not. And collaboration is something that will strengthen. Oh, go ahead, Rob. Sorry to, I, I feel like I'm talking way too much, <laughs> but I haven't heard anyone talk much about the, you know, item two for monitoring yep. those proposals. And I think I would just kind of put it out there that um, grateful as we are for this funding, we've learned an awful lot. And I think one, one of the things we learned is that we maybe stretched ourselves too thin um, because there was so much collaboration, consultation, stakeholder consulting that we didn't budget for. Um, in addition to the usual logistical hassles of, of field work. Um, and I just don't see us building this um, sort of um, monitoring program four or five hydrophones at a time. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it would need to be something bigger. It would need to be, it would need to involve much, many more stakeholders, many more um, collaborators. Um, and I'd love to hear if someone would like to lead on that and we could, we could play more of a supporting role um, I think our ex one of the things we learned, I think, is that our expertise is more on the killer whale side than um, than just measuring noise for the sake of noise. So would this be building on to your previous this previous work and creating more of a a network and um... absolutely, yes. Yeah. So if we think of that pilot study we did last mm -hmm. year with obvious implications for what the attribute, what the indicator should look like, what are its attributes. Um, as Scott outlined, phase one, phase two, phase three, um, there will be a natural leader for phase two or phase three, and it, it's, it, that's not us. Um, <laughs> that's not our strength, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, and just reflecting, yeah. This is work like we're proposing projects that would take place over two years. I think the max funding for a submitted proposal is 120 grand. So just thinking about how that could yeah look for developing a yeah program. That sounds like it would be a lot, <laughs> a lot of work. But I think that's great to put on our our radar. Okay, yeah, and Francis added, there seems to be a, a glaring gap in this group in terms of input from tribes. And uh, one of our, the things that we do wanna focus on is increasing tribal participation in this group. Um, so if you have any thoughts of, of how we could increase participation from tribes. Super interested to hear that from you or anyone still on this call. And I think since we do have six minutes left, I'll kind of stop sharing my screen. Just thank everyone for participating in this discussion. I know it's a little, we're still in February, this is due in April, but it's really good to start thinking about potential collaboration and proposal ideas. Um, so we'll be consolidating this and, and sending out some notes with the meeting summary just to start wheels going, <laughs> thinking about potential proposals. And now I wanna yeah go back to your comment, Francis. Um, well, I guess I was just gonna respond to your comment about how do we get tribes to participate in this group and I would say you know 
all these groups, all these, there are so many working groups and so many like advisory groups and we're all asking for tribes participation and they are stretched and they're over capacity. They don't, they, so let's not ask them to participate in another group. Let's find mm -hmm. a more meaningful way for getting input, getting guidance from what they see as things that are important and that we, we should be considering as well and really trying to think more about how do we think about some of these, these things in terms of co-management um, and, and what, what is meaningful in that way. And that's what mm -hmm. I would just throw out there. Yeah, and I think it's it's important to meet them where they're they're at and not ask them, like you said, resources are already stretched and just participating in a group might not be the best use <laughs> of of time. Alejandro. Yeah, um my experience working with tribes and kind of echoing the, the comments by Francis is that first of the only person I know from the tribes who is a marine mammal biologist is John Scordina. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know any other tribal member who is marine mammal biologist. They have many people doing a lot of work with fisheries, uh, salmon, for example, or clam work, green crab work, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the, the issue. And the other issue that, as, as Francis mentioned, I think it's important to, to reach out and to participate. I, I was interested in doing a project in the Grace Harbor, and I tried to reach out with uh, the tribe there. And, oh, I forgot the name of the tribe, so I'm embarrassed to say. But anyway, and, and they're overstretched, just as Francis said. So then we shift to do a project with the Nisqually tribe, and we found always willing partners and they're happy to help us, but they don't have that expertise, which is where, where sorry, we come and try to work together. So I, I would argue that they're reaching out as I think you mentioned Nicole and Francis, reaching out and, and, and listen to their needs and their knowledge and trying to work together into a proposal in which we all want to participate will be important. Um, anyway, that's my experience. Thank you, Alejandro. I don't want to cut this um, topic off if there's any other thoughts. We have two minutes and I do just want to ask if anyone has any agenda items they want to consider for us to consider and, and reach out um, to organize potentially for the next meeting. I have one quick thought on, on the tribal connections. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a really good point, and it's something I've been trying to work on slowly, Frankie, but uh, a little glimmer of hope is that um, Arcasan has been collaborating with this Canadian Halo project, which is also building open source artificial intelligence. And one of their partners on a new grant, a four-year grant, is the Wasanich tribe, the First Nations on the other side of Harrow Strait. Um, so there is David Dick, who's leading something called the Marine Guardian Program that looks really interesting and they're interested in deploying hydrophones. So I think that may be one way we could bring at least some of those stakeholders into the into the fray and and maybe they're you know Lamy brothers and sisters on the other side of the strait on the border um, could follow. I'm not sure exactly if that'll that'll apply, but one of the things Don has funded is is trying to get a, a hydrophone listening in Rosario Strait. And so we have been starting conversations with the Lummi about having a node there. So there may be a noise connection there that could leverage the sort of community science that you've already pioneered, Rob, with Aaron. Um, but just, that's a that's a thought. And we've had a hydrophone out in Nia Bay before, thanks to the connection with John. So there's a history there. Um, hopefully we can re you know, revive the network a bit and grow it in, into some partnerships. And, and briefly, Scott, about this project that you just mentioned, it, two of my former grad students are fisher biologists with the lamination. And wow. although they're not working specifically with marine mammals, they certainly will be very happy. And I'll be very happy if I can help to make connections or try to find a way to get this specific project that you're talking about. Great. I'll follow up with you. Thanks, Alan. I, 
I also want, you know, I just want to caution, it's not just the Lummi here in the San Juans, there's 12 um, treaty tribes that we consult with here, and that's just here. Um, so it's going to, you know, you, you can't just talk to one, you gotta make sure that you're talking to, to everyone. And it is important because, um, you know, there are, there are areas where tribes are really hesitant about that we may be like, yeah, we want to make MPAs and this is a great thing. Well, you're going to run into roadblocks really quickly um, if you don't engage early on and in a meaningful way. Um, so it isn't, you know, I, I don't raise it rashly. I, 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 I just, I do want to caution folk on that. Thank you. And recognizing it is 301. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you do have a couple minutes and have something on your mind um, that you want us to consider for the next meeting, please, please let me know. Um, for example, Francis, I think you uh, recommended we bring in someone to talk about the Aleutian Isle incident at our last meeting. So that kind of prompted Dawn to come. So thank you for um, recommending that. And I'm going to stop recording. And our uh, next, our action item is we're going to get out the meeting summary.